I'm David Kelly. I'm a senior fellow at the Atlas Society and a consultant to the Atlas Shrugged Movies. Ayn Rand is well known for advocating capitalism, not the crony capitalism mixed economy we live in today, but a system of genuinely free exchange. But she said, I'm not primarily an advocate of capitalism, but of egoism. She was pretty well known for that too, notorious even for challenging the ethics of altruism. But she went even deeper in her philosophy and said, I'm not primarily an advocate of egoism, but of reason. Rand saw the faculty of reason as the glory of human nature, the source of every human achievement. It's what has enabled us to advance over the millennia, from caves to high-rise condos, from hunting and gathering to the global information economy of today. And in her moral philosophy, rationality is the primary virtue. Now, does that mean Rand dismissed emotions, that she wanted us to ignore them or suppress them? To answer that question, let's start by watching two scenes from Atlas Shrugged Part 3. Both scenes are set in Galt's Gulch, the valley where the strikers John Galt has recruited are gathered. Dagny has crash landed in the valley. She has not joined the strike, but she and Galt have fallen in love. In the first scene, they visit Francisco Danconia at his copper mine. I still don't understand why you don't use mules, Francisco. Mules, John? These animals are not so friendly. They're just as stubborn as women. Frisco, you are wasting an unconscionable amount of time bringing your copper ore up this way. You ought to build a rail line down the smelter. I know, but it's such a difficult job. Besides, the mine's output doesn't justify the expense. That's nonsense. You see that pass to the east? Uh, it's an easier grade with softer stone. It wouldn't take a lot of curves. Maybe three miles of rail, narrow gauge. You have a pen and paper? Hmm. It'll pay for itself in three years. Here, look. I might have to blast a tunnel here, a few hundred feet or less, and I'd need a steel trestle to bring the track across this gorge. It would bring it down here. It's not that difficult. And it would cut off that last mile of corkscrew turns. I could have the track laid in three months. <laughs> oh, what for? Abandon an entire transcontinental system to build three miles of railroad. If you change your mind, I'll hire you on the spot. Or Midas can give you a loan if you want to own it. No, I can't, not yet. I wish I could just stay here and never know what my brother is doing to the railroad. Well, you would hear about it. Every wreck, every explosion, every broken line. And eventually, the collapse of the Taggart Bridge. Well, that's not gonna happen. Dagny, nobody stays here by faking reality. Well, I'll get back to my job then. Enjoy your last week, Dagny. Okay, guys. There's a lot going on in this scene, but I want to focus on one moment when Dagny says, I wish I could just stay here and never know what my brother's doing to the railroad. Galt says, but you would hear about it. Dagny, nobody stays here by faking reality. Both Galt and Dagny are rational people, highly intelligent to boot. And Dagny writes out a plan for a rail line, thinking it through quickly and with great confidence. It's a brilliant example of reasoning. Galt has the same brilliance as a thinker. But rationality is not just about the process of coming up with ideas and thinking logically. Rationality also means an unwavering commitment to grasping reality. It means being objective, accepting facts as facts, whether you like them or not. Galt loves Dagny. He wants nothing more than to have her join the strike and stay with him. But he won't sugarcoat the facts to make it easier for her. Rationality is not just a matter of reasoning well. It is also a moral commitment to finding the truth and living by it. A commitment to not faking reality. Now our next scene is on Dagny's final night in the valley when she has to decide whether to join the strike or to leave. So Dagny, have you made your decision? I think so, but I'm not sure. And it's too important not to be completely certain. If any of your uncertainty is a conflict between your heart and your mind, follow your mind. That wasn't the advice I was expecting. Let it go until it's time. We still have you with us tonight. Francisco, 
He'll be back in a few months. November at the latest. And John, you're not returning to New York this time, are you? I haven't decided yet. <laughs> you're not thinking about going back to that hell, are you? I am. But John, why? Well, I'll tell you once I've decided. But everyone's here except Hank, and he'll be here soon enough. And Dagny, if she chooses, your job is done. There's nothing more for you to look for out there. I know. When the rails are nationalized, everything will collapse. Why risk it? They are getting serious about the disappearances. They suspect something. You, of all people, shouldn't be there. The infrastructure's falling apart. Just the physical risk of complex machinery in the hands of blind fools. You'll be taking a chance every time you step on a train. There's been one collision after another. Not to mention the weapons the SSI have been testing to maintain the peace, as they say. If I go back, it won't be for the strike. It'll be to get the only thing I want for myself. There's going to be riots. Electricity's being rationed. Food supply chains are being severed. <laughs> In no time at all, there'll be one train a week, and then one train a month, and then the Taggart Bridge will collapse. No. No, that won't happen. And you've made your decision. I have. As long as I am alive, I will not desert a battle that is mine to fight. You'll be back, Dagny, and we'll be here waiting for you. We need to discuss the conditions of your departure. First, you have to give us your word that you won't disclose anything about this valley. You can't reveal our, our cause, our existence, your whereabouts for the past month to anyone for any reason. I give you my word. Second, you could never attempt to come back uninvited again. This is another example of the tension between thought and feeling. It's the same tension between Dagny's love for Galt and her judgment about what's best for the railroad. But this time, Galt names the tension. If any of your uncertainty is a conflict between your heart and your mind, follow your mind. So does that mean Rand looked down on emotion? No. She was opposed to emotionalism and wishful thinking. She was opposed to blind faith. But she did not think we should ignore our feelings, much less repress them. An important principle in her philosophy, objectivism, is there's no inherent conflict between reason and emotion, as many other philosophers have believed. But reason and emotion do have different roles to play in the way we function as human beings. Reason is a cognitive faculty. Its function is to acquire knowledge about the world, including knowledge about ourselves, our goals, the best ways to achieve them. Emotions, along with feelings and desires, are what psychologists call the affective modes of consciousness. Cognition identifies things and facts. Affect reacts to them as good or bad for us and motivates us to act accordingly. Now, no one would want to live without emotion. Happiness is an emotion. What's not to like about that? It's just that feeling something is true or wanting it to be true doesn't prove that it is true. Wishing doesn't make it so. The fact that reason and emotion play different roles doesn't mean that there's any inherent conflict. Your heart and your stomach play different roles in your body. Your heart can't digest food. Your stomach can't pump blood. But they work together, and the same is true for thinking and feeling, most of the time. But sometimes the head and the heart do pull in different directions, as with Dagny's agonizing choice. When that happens, Galt's advice is right. To choose well, you need to think well. To know you're right, you need to use your only source of knowledge, your rational mind.